David Bowie has an announcement to make. Let's now go over live by satellite to beautiful downtown Burbank in Los Angeles. It's nice to see you, David. You look well. What color is your Thank hair? You. Which bit? The, the, the center bit at the top, above where your nose would be. Well, it's, what color does it look? Well, it looks like a bit of something out of the end of Straw Dogs. Something out of the end of Straw Dogs. You've got an announcement to make to us all, David, haven't you? You're, you're changing your plans for the future, and you've got something up your sleeve for 1976. Yes, um, I'm touring, but I'm in, I'm coming back to England in May to uh, play shows and and uh, look at you and look at England well, you know, and uh, be be there, be English again. Well, as always, but you... English in England. What's brought you back? Are you short of money, or are you short of the feeding off live audience bit? I'm short of England more than anything else. In what way? I mean, you do know that the England you left two years ago is not the England you're going to come back to. Yeah, well, this Thursday is, is nothing like last Thursday, but it's just as important. I'd miss it if it wasn't after Wednesday. Yeah. Do you know that uh, the pop scene though, at this end, the pop world has changed somewhat since you left? No, no. Have you heard of the Bay City Rollers? Yes. Well, you know that they, they are appealing to a kind of large, mass hysterical audience of young people yes. who wave a lot of stuff around. Now, I wonder what kind of audience you're going to come back to face. I don't know. What do you think? You may have to create a whole new scene for yourself. No. Well, I can't qualify that. I'll just come back and play my songs. <laughs>have pushed the boundaries quite as spectacularly as David Bowie. During a career spanning half a century, he was an innovator unlike any other. I've been doing this for a whole century. Um, and I, I'm really very comfortable doing it. It, it feels, uh, it's very fulfilling. Pop star, composer, showman, actor, producer. David Bowie symbolized versatility like few musicians could. The constant evolution of his style, sound, and artistic persona had a colossal influence on popular culture. David, hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How very, very good to be here tonight. I can't quite believe how much rubbish I've written in my life. Because <laughs> inevitably, when you go to old tapes, you find all the things you never wanted to release. And you kind of find out, it becomes very apparent why. <laughs> so, but some of it is just too funny, and so I have to put it out. He brought a theatricality to the pop world, which gave him a very strong image. He thought very theatrically and he thought about presentation. Um, it just won't stop. My personal need to entertain has changed a lot. Uh, I think when I was young, I was about creating theatricality and creating a more artificial kind of parallel reality uh, on stage. And as I've gotten older, especially over the last five or six years, I've really fallen into the comfort of actually just interpreting the song.
cause a stir, then wear a dress at a press conference in Texas, which is what David did. He looked weird. Everything about him was right to be a star, against all odds in a way. As far as style is concerned, I don't really think that I want to have a style. Um, sort of, oh yeah, that's a David Bowie sound, you know. I much prefer to be sort of a free agent and move from one thing to another as my enthusiasms take me. When you were thinking about what to wear on this tour, did mm. you think of what it would look like translated onto thousands of fans? Or... I just wanted something very simple, you know, a simple outline. Yeah. So what we're wearing tonight. <laughs> The landscape of fashion has changed, but it's changed because of people like David Bowie. That concept of androgyny, the science fiction look, the colors, the dyed hair, this was all red meat to designers. Clearly, David was a genius in that area as well. Now, when you come back to England, you're not presumably coming back with the glamoury, glittery, ziggy stardust thing, are you? Uh-huh. Are, are you coming back as that? Well, I don't I haven't. I don't know yet. I haven't uh, even worked on it. So you, I think it'll probably... Hmm? You, you it'll be a lot more spontaneous. What? <laughs> you, you haven't planned your wardrobe. You haven't planned a, a figure. You haven't planned an image, whatever that may mean. I, I think the image I may adopt may well be uh, me. I'm sort of sort of uh, uh, inventing me at the moment. You mean reinventing you yourself? Yes, yeah, self-invented. <laughs> From the waist upwards. Yes, jolly mm. uncomfortable. What are you going to wear? I mean, are you going to wear a little suit, a straight suit, or are you going to be? I know what songs I'm going to sing, which is the most important thing. <laughs> David Bowie didn't just entertain, he intrigued and provoked. After 50 years in the spotlight, the legendary musician somehow managed to retain a sense of mystery. I never really thought that I, I could do it, but in a way my band have, have egged me on to, to kind of be like this, you know. And so it's been less and less theatre, more and more band and sing, sing, sing. Along with the Beatles and Elvis Presley, Bowie obliterated musical boundaries and defined what pop music should be. Testing. We're back to rock and roll. One, two, three, four, one, two. We're talking about one of the most influential 20th century icons of all. Don't forget to tip your waitresses. He left a permanent mark on more than one generation. People I've talked to have worked with you say you're a very personal person, if you know what I mean. Very people who go out with me? No, to work with you. Oh, is it you're people a, who go very, out with You're me? a very, um, not secretive, but personal. Keep things to yourself. Quite, quite quiet, yes. Do you think you're shy? No. <laughs> no, I'm not really shy. I'm just a bit quiet. Do you think if you didn't keep things to yourself, people wouldn't be surprised at what you did next? I've never really thought about that. I'll let you know after the show. OK. After the show. <laughs> I think he got to where he wanted to be, which was a kind of Lennon plateau, and it doesn't get any higher than that. I don't believe that there have been really any major artists that have had the creative portfolio that David had. Quite rightly, it was said, that the Beatles affected the way young people thought. And I think it's the same with Bowie. Here is one of the people who made the greatest difference in our world in our lifetime. Sounds like a mighty big claim, but it's true. It took years of work for David Robert Jones to emerge as one of the most influential figures in music. Growing up in the austerity of post-war Britain, he came of age in the swinging 60s. He was born in the Brixton suburbs of London in 1947 to mother Margaret and Bernardo's charity worker, Hayward John Jones. 
David invited me down to his parents' place. There I was at 14 with this kind of man from another planet as far as I was concerned. It sounds silly now, but I'd never been to a working class house. I was in culture shock, but that was my own limited upbringing. His house, which was tiny, and the two main seats of the parents who were there, both facing the television. And uh, remember the mother made us uh, some tuna fish sandwiches, but the, the parents didn't speak. It was a, I'd never been into such a cold house. This is what shocked me. I'd never visited a house where people didn't laugh and make merry and be joyous because it was just, oh, it was like a, walking around with, a, with cement blocks on your shoulders. I met his dad, it was sort of pretty bourgeois. People say he was working class, but I don't think so. It didn't strike that way to me. David said to me then, I'll never forget this, he said, whatever it takes, I want to get out of this place. I never, ever want to grow up here. David was introduced to rock and roll at an early age through his elder brother Terry's record collection. The recurring theme of mental instability in Bowie's early work connects to Terry, who was institutionalized with schizophrenia and committed suicide in 1985. He did go and see his brother in the mental hospital. I didn't realize the enormity of the impact on the family, actually. And after that, he never mentioned his brother. Well, I never met the brother because he was institutionalized then. But I did meet his mum, and she was just a very average lady. I feel now quite sorry for the mother. She was very stiff, very starchy. You, didn't have, you had no chance of getting to know her properly. She was very reserved. Quite often later on, several years later, the mother would be ringing up while David was starting to get more and more famous and he would never, often didn't want to speak to her. So Angie, of course, being the perfect hostess, it would be the buffer to say, oh, he's busy or can't make it. So I don't know that he was that close with his parents. By the time he was six, the Jones family had moved to the suburban streets of Bromley in Kent. David attended Burnt Ash Primary School and showed aptitude in singing and playing the recorder. This inspiring how we went to our school. I think you must have been right, the most famous ex-pupil of the school. 20, 30 years ago, he was um, thought of as quite radical. David Bowie appeared on the film Labyrinth. Personally, I, I didn't understand him. David Jones was recognised at school as much for his vividly artistic dance as he was for his vocals and flair for instruments. I don't recall anyone having lessons. You just listened to your records, if you could get any from America, and played along with them or sang along with them. You gonna mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. It's rather disturbing because when you're young, you think so much is important, including oneself. <laughs> but as you get older, I think you, you find less and less is important, apart from some very fundamental things. Uh, one of them being a love of one's fellow man and uh, a care for their survival and a care for one's immediate family, then friends, and then wider like a circle, like ripples in, a, in, in water. After failing his 11 plus exams, David Jones attended Bromley Technical College, where he studied art, music, and design. He displayed an early interest in aliens, creating a UFO magazine, and would later claim to have seen battalions of alien craft Angie and I, I think we were in England 
And Bowie rings up from America saying he's just spoken to somebody who's been to Roswell, the place where the aliens landed. And he said, I know that there's one there. And he rang especially to say, you know, this is definitely it. The alien has landed. It's in cold storage in some government bunker somewhere. And he absolutely believed it. And so did we, because he said he'd seen it. During David Jones' adolescence, there was one indelible incident in 1962 which would forever change his image. The incredibly photogenic eyes were partly a result of his being punched by his friend, George. It was an uh, unintended uh, um, damage I did to his eye when I was 15. Uh, it was over a girl and it was a silly thing and he said afterwards, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it. But it was just one of the stupid things you do when you're a kid and uh, I, don't, I didn't go around hitting people in, in the eye uh, as a hobby. It wasn't something I did, you know, it was just once and that was it. I never ever, you know, wanted to, I was felt awful afterwards that, um, you know, it's made him quite distinctive in the end. Fortunately, he did say later that I did him a favor. It just changed the look of the eye. But for fashion reasons, this is magnetic. So bizarrely, he owed George <laughs> for hitting him. But they remain friends, and that's the important thing. David Bowie spent the 1960s enduring a succession of false starts. He would later steer music into new areas of exploration, and despite becoming one of the most iconic musicians of all time, he only performed because no one else would sing his songs. I, I will be king. I hate my singing voice. I hate singing. Really, it's not an enjoyment. I mean, it, you know, someone's got to do it. Uh, I like interpreting songs. I guess that's what I, it is about the whole process. I like writing firstly and foremostly. I would give my right arm, maybe not my right arm, I would give somebody's right arm if I could find somebody to sing all my songs for me. I really would. I don't think singers hate their singing voice, it's only false modesty. I don't think he had any ego at all, until he got into the cocaine trip, which really did him in. He didn't have a great voice. One of the things that attracted me to him, he sang like Anton Newley. Well, I always thought that he sounded very like Anton Newley, and I never knew that he acknowledged that. Don't you realize we're living to die? I'm happy to sign the good old bad old day. Today, Anthony Newley is a bit of a forgotten name, but he was massive when Bowie was growing up. Continually on television, he was a Renaissance man. Some people say they long for the old days to take them way back when. There's a hugely strong connection. I mean, Anthony Neely was a, a massive inspiration and influence over David in his early days. I mean, this was somebody that he did rate highly. Neely, in fact, was a great actor. He looked up to him because we both came from the same era when the one cool television show called something like Wild Life of Gurney Slade. Tony Newley was the star, and anyone who was anybody and cool and hip watched this program. If you check back to some of Anthony Newley's hits and then compare that with The Laughing Gnome, and you'll see an absolute direct line between the two. The crossover that Anthony Newley made from the theatrical side into pop would have made him, you know, slightly more visible to artists like David Bowie. Anthony Newley was involved in musicals and the whole sort of dramatic thing that he also represented, that was part of the Newley package, if you like, as far as David was concerned. I remember Tony Newley was doing something in the Marquee Club, it was something called Ready Steady Goes Live. And he was there, and Bowie made quite sure that he was there too to, to listen to him.
David Jones left school with one O-level, in art. The late 60s saw him working his apprenticeship as a musician and displaying early signs that he was pursuing an identity. First, with blues-influenced bands such as the Conrads, which he formed aged 15. When we first met, we were about nine years old. We became best friends. We stayed very close and formed various little bands together. And I decided the music scene wasn't for me. And I went back to finish my art college, but I knew David was destined for bigger things. Because he was just an extraordinary chap. I'd never met anyone like him. After performing in a series of unremarkable bluesy folk acts, the aspiring artist went through several reinventions en route to space oddity. It's obvious that he liked blues from the records he made with his early group, but nothing to suggest that he had anything really original to offer. He saw himself as a folk singer and he was patrolling the folk clubs in London looking for gigs, but I think he didn't fit into any category. We did a gig very early on. It was a very small gig somewhere before he dressed up, as it were. And it could have been that it was an early gig. It could have been for whatever reason. I just felt he was a bit lost and a bit tentative. So didn't know what to do his arm. He was much better performing in a role. I always felt that he looked much more comfortable when he had I don't know, some outfitty thing. At that time, I felt he needed these various persona to give himself confidence on stage. You can see why he said he didn't want to go on stage being himself, because he's quite reserved. He didn't see the type of bloke that would jump on stage and dress like Ziggy Stardust. I really enjoyed just performing songs and not having the commitment of having to be a character, which has made it less of a strain than it normally is. There's not so much uh, artifice attached to what I'm doing these days. I, I still like the idea of doing a theatrical thing, and uh, it doesn't uh, preclude me maybe doing one in the future. It must have been 1963 or 4. He came out on stage at the Marquee Club. It was David Jones and the King Bees, and he came out with his bright yellow lemon-coloured hair, which was really unusual in those days, dressed in a slightly Sherwood Forest Robin Hood look, as in knee-length suede boots with uh, tassels. This was reacting against a very monochrome background the rock bands arriving were pretty, you know, still jeans and sometimes with your back to the audience on long guitar solos and all of that. I, I don't think anybody had really given quite as much thought to the idea of presenting their music as David was now expressing. He was a showman. He was a, you know, he knew how to impress people. I was amazed at how good he was because I didn't realize how good a singer he was and what, what presence he had on stage. There were no echoes of, of uh, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that, and uh, hesitancy. He just went for it. After the whole show was over, he just comes up and says to me, can I come home with you tonight? And I said, yeah. We walked back to South Kent, 25 minutes walk, and he stayed the night on my top floor. In the morning, coming down at sort of breakfast time, because I had to go off to school, uh, I introduced him to my parents who were coming out of their bedroom. And, I, and I, my father told me afterwards they actually thought it was a girl, that I just had a girlfriend to stay. But no, when I said this is David Jones, they weren't <laughs> they were quite surprised. He used to, I think, attract far more attention than me because he used to sometimes come and pick me up from school. The girls in my class reminded me the other day that they were all kind of noses pressed to the window looking at him. Yeah, he was eye-catching. Enrolling in Lindsay Kemp's London Dance Centre, Bowie began to explore the world of mime. What is the best thing you've done? On, on any stage, anywhere, that, that still lives with you, that you measure, use as a measuring stick? Best, best it's, that's very hard. One of the most exciting things I did was work with uh, 
old Lindsay, Lindsay Kemp, back in um, the, the uh, where would it be? I can't remember which theatre we did it in, but years ago, well, it was a combined sort of mixed media show. That was very good. And it didn't, it didn't have to be a big, glossy, exciting thing. I mean, it was a small, but something important mm. to you. Well, yes, of yes, Right. David was very into sort of his whole Lindsay Kemp thing at that moment. My son was so white faced, the miming. Got him to show me a bit. He was very into all that mime stuff. Definitely, he learned a lot from Lindsay, but that was sort of a, a side thing. He taught David stagecraft. David learned mime from him, and he was very, very grateful to Lindsay for what he learned. Lindsay always said that he often did his shows on acid, which I thought was pretty good because it's quite hard to do shows on acid. Lindsay was absolutely besotted with David. He was totally in love with him. David had been exploring that whole sort of visual presentation thing and the whole thing about the, the face and, and the eyes and, and, and the body movements. And that's what drew me into feathers. Bowie toured with Lindsay Kemp for a year before leaving to form the band Feathers with Hermione Farthingale, the girl who inspired life on Mars. The first time I saw David was at an underground psychedelic club in Covent Garden called Middle Earth and he was there with his group Feathers and his girlfriend Hermione. It was a sort of mixed media group as they were called at the time. He wasn't doing much of the lead singing in Feathers, he was much more the mime artist and the person who was expressing the music. I had thought he was magnetic, I really did. I rented this house 45 years ago, and as one did, I put an ad in the paper, and Hermione Farthingale rang and said she'd like to see the place. She said, the trouble is, there are two of us. And I said, that's fantastic. Anyway, she came, and the boyfriend she had was David Bowie. David wasn't known then. He uh, held back. He didn't so much mingle with the rest of us. He used to borrow my clothes because I was in the fashion business. Anything I had that was funky, he would borrow and wear. I would go with him to Carnaby Street, you know, in 64, 65. He was very trendy dresser. He always was in a, a uniform or in a look. He didn't slop out in a pair of ripped jeans and t-shirts. Some years later, Hermione left David because she, she was doing small time movies and she fell in love with uh, one of the actors in the movie and she left David and David was broken hearted. Well, he was in love with her but he didn't treat her very well. David had a serious control over his heart for many, many years. His heart lay with performing, songwriting and music. And if he thought his heart was broken, it was for only for a minute in time. He was a, a rascal. And of course, the neighbors objected um, to us being so wild. So I didn't want to leave the house, but David had to go. Bowie considered leaving music altogether. In 1967, he retreated to a Buddhist monastery in Scotland. I think a lot of youth find it very hard to find exactly where it is they're supposed to fit into this new, rather terrifying world. Um, I think I would feel very much like that. I think maybe I would shrink back into wanting to find a more spiritual kind of life. I think maybe I would maybe backpack through the world and get to India and do all those things that my generation tended to do in the 60s, you know. Um, it would be a very hard choice. But mind you, I would be, uh, yes, I would become a monk, but a monk who played an awful lot of guitar. He went to Samuel Ling Tibetan Center in Dumfriesshire and stayed there for about a month and did some very intensive meditation practice. And 
As a result of that, I think at one stage he did consider becoming a monk. I was still sort of wondering whether I should be, if I had found God as a Buddhist, or <laughs> whether I wanted to be a rock and roll star. He told me that he never really lost the music and that it was with him all the time, on the cushion, in the dining room, out walking in the hills. It was just buzzing through his head. And he realised, I think, eventually that he was not being true to himself. And so he packed up and went back to London and show business. <laughs> David Bowie began 1969 as far from his pop ambitions as he'd been throughout the 60s. Once when we were both a bit broke, we both went to audition for Hair, you know, the musical where everyone in the end takes their clothes off. We both got turned down. <laughs> had a job in a copying office in London, a place called Ligastat, but he only did it about once a fortnight, he hated it. And he had the old gig here and there, but no, he was broke. I supported him for quite some time. Everything that he had, he put to good use, and occasionally, okay, you know, if it meant being a bit slutty occasionally, or whatever, you did what you had to do in order to get to the next level in the business. He was entirely totally and completely focused. I think when you are driven, when you really got something to say, um, then inevitably you, you, you're going to make sure that you achieve that, and that definitely applied to David. He was absolutely dedicated to his career. I mean, music was the focus of his life. During the time when he was sitting around the flat not doing very much, he was constantly composing. He was never idle. Are you being absolutely accurate and honest when you say you're a disciplined person? Oh, yes. You, you impose a, a, a discipline on your own music writing, on your own work, do you? I mean, you don't just get up when you... You know, you know, you know what I'm saying to you? A lot of people in your position yeah, have a, a kind of uh, reputation. A discipline doesn't mean that you, you make sure that you um, have breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning right. and you are out of the house by half past 8. Uh, discipline is that you, if you uh, uh, conceive something, then you decide whether or not it's worth following through. And if it's worth following through, then you follow it through to its logical conclusion Good. and do it with the best of, to the best of your ability. That's the discipline. Yes. I've that now. Whether whether there are areas in it that are not to one's liking, you have to go right the way through it and do it, and that's what I do. By the spring of 1969, Bowie was living with journalist Mary Finnegan in the London suburb of Beckenham. He was living in my apartment as my lodger, but it was never a sort of conventional landlady-lodger relationship. He was extremely messy. He never did anything around the house, unless it suited his purpose. He staged a very elegant seduction for me by cooking me a very nice dinner when I came home from the shift at the Sunday Times. And then he made a sort of nest of cushions in his room and he put big speakers on either side of my ears and then played me his favourite music. I was pretty broke and so was he, absolutely penance, and our lifestyle was unsustainable. So he had the idea to start a folk club and we found a location in a pub in Beckenham and they gave us the back room and in the first week there were about 25 people, second week there were 90, and after that it was absolutely jam-packed, never less than 120 crowned in. The Beckenham Arts Laboratory, David based the whole idea of it on the existing arts laboratory in Drury Lane. We took the psychedelic environment ambiance out of central London and set it up in the suburbs 
and I think it's probably one of the first in the suburban environment. London was so vibrant in those days. Everything just was exploding into this burst of colour. It is often said that us fortunate people who were young in the 60s had the best sex, the best drugs, and the best music. You know, you've got new magazines, new uh, newspapers, new venues, new places to go, a new order. You know, this counterculture, as it was called, was a reality. And David loved it. It was an arts laboratory. It was art of any form or variety. He compared it and he performed his own set and he got the confidence as a performer week after week after week. It was the bedrock of his rise to stardom, his ascent to the stratosphere. It was a brief slice of social history which was really quite remarkable and I'm glad that I was part of that. I thoroughly enjoy l looking at myself and looking at the environment that I'm in at any time with the eyes of someone who's not involved in, in any particular line of the arts. So it, it comes out as a sort of eclectic uh, manifestation, you know. So I'm a, still a fan of everything, fan of films, fan of records, fan of rock bands and fan of yours. <laughs> As one of the most consistently great British songwriters of all time, David Bowie's skills as a lyrical storyteller remain unparalleled. I don't have a problem writing. Uh, I, I do write a lot over the course of a year. It's never really been um, hard for me to do that. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't painful in any way. And the only painful albums I've had, uh, well, I think, were way back in the 70s. That was that, uh, uh, there were a couple of instances where it was really hard for me to write because I felt I was uh, delivering great chunks of my soul up there. But that was the state of mind, I guess. The other thing in the, in the sort of mix of everything that sometimes gets neglected is David's brilliance as a songwriter. David didn't write love songs at a time when everybody was writing love songs. That's what you did. And he didn't write love songs. And it was brilliant. We would often go to something called the Giaconda Cafe, which is in Denmark Street, Tin Pan Alley. And you'd sit in this cafe and you'd nurse a cup of tea for hours because at any moment anyone from the song publishing companies would rush in and say, Oi, we need a bass player, or Oi, we need a backing singer. And there you'd sit and wait till somebody came and called you in for something. So we spent a lot of time there. We were looking for a comedy song for me to recall. So I went along and met David. And I think it was just him and I. And I would have been about 22, and he'd have been about 20, I think. So he was a very young man and hadn't at this point changed his name to Bowie. And uh, I was very struck by him. He was very serious, because <laughs> I'm not overly serious. But he was quite, I felt, intense for a young man. I was beginning to wonder whether this man, who seemed quite serious, would have the element of comedy that was required for the thing that I was looking for. David had written this song called Over the Wall We Go. Over the wall we go, oh, coppers and honors. Over the wall we go, leave them He played it to me and I thought it was very funny. I said, yeah, I think that's a good song, let's have a go at that. So we went into the studio, recorded it. He introduced the character, which was a slightly more camp chap. Uh, <laughs> David does a little bit in the, in the middle, where he does a roll call. Double three, four, two, three. Oh, in here. Double three, four, two, four. Hello. Double three, four, two, five. Hi. Double three, four, two, six. Double three, four, two, six. Where is he?
And it, it was very big, it was very brash, very brassy, well arranged, and um, immediately got banned by the BBC. It was felt it was too... So I feel quite proud to have been associated with a song that was banned by the BBC. I suppose that's the difference between... I don't want to compare myself to him, but, you know, I went off and had a fag and a laugh, and he stayed with it. Fifty songs isn't enough, I've realised, you know. I heard uh, Green with Envy, Dylan's got like 140 songs he chooses from, you know. And I can see that you've got to build up to that, because even when you've got 50, there are some that you're going to get fed up with faster than others. So that 50 becomes kind of a 30 with an unwritten 20 that you don't actually want to ever play again. So you're back to 30 again. Um, so I think you have to go for at least 100 to then end up with like 50 that you like doing. <laughs> The root of Bowie's genius lay in his ability to write classic pop songs, and lots of them. I take my work very seriously, but I try not to let it topple over into uh, uh, my psychological life too much mm. and tear me apart like maybe it used to. So is it very much work? I mean, I mean, are you able to kind of, or do you carry the whole thing with you throughout that period? Is it a necessary <clears throat> part where you need to forget it and have your personal life? And... No, 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 it's always with me, but not quite the same way that it used to be. Uh... Probably the priority in my life is my domestic and private life. Um, but it's reflected in my work. The songwriting was the core of it all. It's his songwriting will be remembered. We're coming right back now to, to man and acoustic guitar. So you strip away all the other stuff and just bring it back to that. Voice and song. And David was absolutely world class. His lyrics, if there wasn't any other lyric line but to see the mice in their million hordes from Ibiza to the Norfolk Broads, you know, you'd pin that as being one of the great lyric lines ever. Uh, and David seemed almost able to pull this stuff out almost effortlessly. That was the extraordinary thing. I do see that the, the writing that I do is, is very much an integral part of my for real 24-hour-a-day life. I do write a little bit every day. Um, some days I hate it. Uh, it's an inconvenience, but it's just something I have to do. And some days I can't wait to sit down and, and write. There was one Cooks which he wrote after Zoe Duncan had been born, and Will you stay in my lover's story? But I was just thinking how sweet he'd written this for his son. A lot of things he wrote with such heart. I have to be comfortable with what I'm doing. And if I feel there's a kind of a, as near to a truth or an integrity about what I do and write, then, then that makes me uh, feel that I'm a successful artist, I guess. Some of Bowie's lyrics owed their composition to the cut-up technique, popularised by the poet William Burroughs. You take a song, and there it is in its right order. You cut it to pieces and then put it back together again randomly, and you are going to get the same words. They're just in a different order. Uh, but the ultimate meaning of the song remains the same. He wasn't a sort of a, you know, artist chiseling away at the coal face of, of creativity. It just seemed to flow out of it. In 1967, Bowie met his first wife, Angela Barnett. She turned up one day after I'd been away and I discovered that she'd more or less moved in with David. And I'm not quite sure why I allowed this to happen, but I was ousted and she replaced me as his lover. 
He was the first one to say to me, look, I've met somebody, I think she's really special, I think you get on well with her. I'm not going to bitch about Angie. She was turbulent. This can go on record, yeah. She was turbulent. She was a drama queen. She threw wobblies quite a bit. Some of them were just straightforward hissy fits. Others were designed to focus attention on her and others to attract somebody that she wanted to impress. Angie and I instantly hit it off. I mean, we were instantly good friends. She was, and so I never had issues with, I was happy that he'd found somebody to be with him. I allowed them to stay in the apartment. She was there pretty well all the time. And why did I do it? I wouldn't tolerate it for 30 seconds now. They would have been out on their ear. Go down there most weekends and hang out with him and Angie. I was having so much fun. I was enjoying it. The activity that went on around the arts lab and the continuous party. I mean, our house became the court of King David. Angie was amazing in those days. She could literally give Angie a carrot and a potato and an onion and she would make enough food to feed everyone because she was that organized. She was very generous. She bought a lot of food and took us out for lots of nice outings. She was the perfect foil for him. She was loud, but highly cultured. You know, she could speak French, she traveled, her parents were very nice, and she was there always for him. We spoke French together, which irritated David no end. We'd both been at school in Switzerland, so we did have quite a common background. He would be in his room often just lolling about with his acoustic guitar or bits of paper having ideas for songs or sometimes he'd play a song to her. She always was positive, she would always say, this is great. In September 1969 they found their own apartment and they moved out. But we stayed friends. My love for him had changed a little bit pretty quickly because I was deeply pissed off about what had happened. But. Um, I was sad for a while, and then annoyed, and then resigned. I read Mary Finnegan's book where she said, you know, she was devastated because he was being unfaithful. I didn't expect faithfulness from, from Bowie. I mean, he was a musician, for goodness sake. It, the, the two don't go together. I didn't know what he got up to when he wasn't there. No, I found that out many years later. Women that thought their hearts were broken were fools, basically, because you don't tame a man like Bowie, especially not in those early years. Yeah, I was pretty upset, but it didn't last very long. I got over it. In August 1969, Bowie and Finnegan organised a free music festival, which was held on the recreation ground in Beckenham. That was kind of the peak experience. And about a thousand people turned up, and we hardly publicised it at all. David was very sad. He was grieving because his father had died about a week earlier. And he performed as a true professional, and nobody who saw him performing would have known. Right from the start, I was aware that David had a vision in terms of what he wanted to do and how he saw himself and the kind of music that he wanted to make. I was an aspiring DJ my whole job was to fill the dance floor and I'd invited David to come down with me because I thought this might be an opportunity for him to play. So he just started going out with Angie and so she came to, I remember her sitting on the edge of the stage. David had a cassette of the backing track of this single that he was working on at the time. So I introduced him. Yeah, I'd been slamming out this really loud music, bass beats and all of that. And David came out with this little acoustic backtrack 
which he then sang live over the top of. But I mean, the volume difference between my dance music and him was huge. And I mean, the floor cleared, people got restless, people were booing, people started throwing beer, and it was just got absolutely chaotic within almost moments. And David had to leave the stage. Um, and I strode into the centre of the stage. I was absolutely furious. I said, you remember this night. This is David Bowie. Remember the name. He's going to be huge. And I really knew it at the time. They just wanted to party. And this rather sort of cookie, acoustic alien that, that arrived on stage was a bit too much for them. Throughout his career, David Bowie's style and image were inextricably linked with his music. Bowie set trends, he created his own styles, his creative vision was about reinventing himself. That was something that no one had done before. Now lots of artists reinvent themselves all the time. We're very used to seeing that, but he was the first person to make himself the focus of his own kind of reinventions. Do you see the way the people out there, how their appearances are changing during the tour? I mean, when they first saw you. It's quite amazing because there's are all seven characters that I've created are out there somewhere. I see a man who fell to earth and a Ziggy Stardust and a thin white juke and, and at the moment a lot of sailor's hats and things. It's, that's incredibly endearing. I, are you aware of the consequences of things that you do and say? I mean, is it possible to be relaxed, to act in a spontaneous way when everything you wear can be suddenly picked up by... Well, it is at the moment because it's not that sort of outrageous, really. I mean, everybody wears plastic, <laughs> don't they? I cannot recall an artist who changed his or her image so frequently, so completely. This caused tremendous problems for his fans who would turn up for his gigs dressed in last year's image and at the interval would look very sheepish because they realized they were wearing the wrong costume. Have you come on the train like that today? Yeah. You came on the underground dressed like that. Did you get a bit of stick from the other passengers? I mean... I sort of look at you. <laughs> Wonder where you're going. Probably the singularly the most uh, important artist in terms of style and fashion. I mean, you only got to look around the, the audience at a Bowie concert and it's uh, a carbon copy of what's going on on stage. I was a compare on a few of the early tour dates. So from the stage, you're getting a pretty unique view of what's happening in front of you. And gradually, you're beginning to see people arrive looking like David. Wow, I mean, you sort of looked out at the whole audience and they'd all made a massive effort to kind of dress up and be Bowie. Ziggy was his best character. When you saw him do Ziggy on stage, what made you decide to look like that? Just brilliant. Just everything you could imagine. What's your name? Ziggy Zowie. Well, what was it before? Well, my real name is Mandy Laming, but that's a bit boring. <laughs> well, I've had the outfit for ages, really. Just built up from sort of a long time ago. I just put it together when I saw his new film. Then I sort of got fed up of dying hair, and sort of as he sort of matured, you sort of grow out of it and want to sort of stay with him. So I just carried on doing that. You think he's ahead of Punk, or he just completely. He's, he's about six years ahead of it, I suppose, yeah. I think he attracts the punks because they like the idea of somebody who's in a constant state of change and also doesn't represent the hippie period. Why do you think they want to look like him? Yeah. Wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you seem really happy on stage to go through the old songs and, and to do them in a new way, and everybody obviously in the audience Yes, goes I'm, along with it. Yeah, I'm having a very good time. But what, can you tell me why it is, though, that your fans are happy to go along with your changes? Do you know what I mean? There are other performers that the Better fans... Better ask them, I think. Yeah, they all seem happy to spend 300 quid and come and see you on tour. Yes. Is that how much my tickets are now? <laughs> no, that's how many concerts they've been to. <laughs> I know, it's quite amazing. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Thank you.
Bowie first tasted commercial success in 1969 when Space Oddity was released, as the world was transfixed with Apollo 11 and its journey of discovery. I just thought it was the greatest song, just the most fantastic, fantastic original song. People don't realize what a slow burn David was in the United States. Space Oddity was not a hit on its immediate release. Uh, it was only a hit after Elton had had Rocket Man in America, and then Space Oddity became a hit, early 73. It, it's inconceivable to think that the albums we consider classics were not, upon release, popular in the United States. I hadn't realized what an impact it was going to make, because it did, actually. It suddenly put him out there as a little bit of the alien, which has stayed with him forever. The song was used by the BBC for their coverage of the moon landing, and although it reached number one, success was far from assured. For all its brilliance, the public thought of it as a novelty record. Then really not very much happened. He sort of disappeared from, from certainly any, any degree of success. It wasn't that easy at the beginning because he wasn't managed by anyone really good until to freeze. But he did what he wanted. I'd signed him for management and I signed him for records. And I, I think the greatest favour I ever did him was he had no interference whatsoever when he was recording. No input from a big record company. Um, and that gave me a huge amount of freedom, which artists didn't usually have. They were just artists, they came. They went. No one thought they were going to make history. Not everyone appreciated David Bowie's songwriting skills. The first time I met Andrew Lloyd Webber, Starman was on the radio. And he said to me, What do you think of this? He can't sing. I used to love rock. I love the Everly Brothers, but I'm losing touch. I don't like this. And of course, that was the change in his writing away from Jesus Christ Superstar, which had been a so-called rock opera. I was the first Mary Magdalene in Jesus Christ Superstar. And that was a very daring thing, Jesus Christ Superstar in those days. Uh, you know, just to call Jesus Christ a superstar, um, offended a lot of people, and we had a lot of people out front protesting. David and Angie came to see Jesus Christ Superstar, and they left in the interval. They hated it. I was mortified. I knew they wouldn't like it. It's not his kind of music. Now, this is a mutual antipathy, because David left at the interval because he didn't like that style of music. Uh, of course, the world was big enough for both of them. They should have stayed for the crucifixion, it was brilliant. Paul Nicholas, who was fabulous, I had to watch him being crucified eight times a week for a year. I was particularly good in that bit. <laughs> I didn't have to do a lot, mind you. <laughs> Artistically, Bowie was powering ahead. In 1970, he formed a short-lived band called Hype through the recruitment of Hull guitarist Mick Ronson. It's impossible to overstate, I think, how important Mick Ronson was to everything that happened. Mick Ronson was a great guitarist, a genius guitarist. If anything, Mick Ronson's contribution to David's sound has been underplayed and under-recognised. I think he was crucial, absolutely crucial, to the sound and image. I don't think he was that comfortable with all the kind of getting down on his knees in front of David and all of that, because he's a straight guy from Hull. A version of Hype would evolve into The Spiders from Mars and create some of Bowie's most groundbreaking work, starting with The Man Who Sold the World, followed by Hunky Dory, which introduced the sexual ambiguity that would become an important part of Bowie's imagery. We 
had Space Oddity and then there was a lull for a moment, but then came Hunky Dory. There's David in a dress on the album cover, unheard of, tame by today's standards where everyone's nearly naked on a pop video. So David is saying to gay people in the early 70s, don't be afraid, you know, be you. Look what we can do, look at me. He was you know, androgynous, gay, he was outrageous, he wanted to, whether it, I didn't which way he was, he didn't, didn't really care. He was already giving all the signals that he was going to blur the lines. Mark Boland, for him, started it. Mark was kind of androgynous in a way, you know, he had his corkscrew hair, uh, he wore ballet shoes and uh, makeup and guys hadn't sort of done that before. But absolutely parallel with that, you know, David was developing the, the Ziggy persona. He questioned his notions of gender and of, of what masculinity is, being a sort of performing artist as opposed to a rock star. But those things have become adopted by a lot of other people since. The bisexual thing it was very well timed, you know, suddenly to be gay was kind of cool in those days. Up until then, nobody was overtly gay. Johnny Ray, who was a huge star, he was gay, but no one knew about it because the fear was no one would buy his records. And I said, you know, and this was the perceived wisdom at the time. You know, I, I was wrong, but I said, you know, girls buy records and girls have their pop stars. And he said, you know, times are changing. Don't worry about it. And he was so bright, he glammed up and he wore the tinsel, but he didn't say he was gay. He was always, in my opinion, far more hetero. He was a real man, strangely enough. Although he had, when naked, he had what I'd call childbearing his hips. His hips were bigger than his very thin shoulders. He had a rather odd shape actually, when star goes. He made it okay. You know, I, you can be successful. You don't have to hide what you are or who you are. And I think that influenced not only other artists, but the public. One object of Bowie's admiration was New York pop art icon Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol was a massive uh, figure in David's life in the late 60s, early 70s, what the factory was doing in New York. He said, look, OK, I've written this song for you, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol is a it's strangely enough, for me, one of the weirdest songs to give to me because it's very abstract. I don't sing abstract, I sing about emotions. I would rather die than have an Andy Warhol can of soup on my wall. But I never felt that close to the song. It was hard to put any emotion into that because Andy Warhol is not, it's not an emotional song. Then he liked my version so much, he did his own version on the Hunky Dory album. And he takes a little snooze. Time up when he's fast asleep. Send him on a pleasant cruise. Hunky Dory was received with moderate success, but all that changed with the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. During 1972, Britain was crippled by industrial action. The mood of the nation was dark and the culture was conservative. This is when Bowie unleashed Ziggy, the leading figure in the glam rock movement, which turned pop in a new direction. It's very funny, it, it's, uh, again, it, it works a lot more because of its mis mistakes than its intentions, but uh, it's great, it's terrific. The, the one thing that comes over to me more than anything else is, is how influenced I was by Japan back then. It, it, it's, uh, it just screams from the screen. Mm. It, it's the whole thing, it looks such like us and stretching over to the east for, for inspiration. I never realized how much that was apparent at the time. The rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, it's, it's so amusing. It's now, of course, a classic, but it didn't even make the top 40 on its original release because American radio uh, considered him too weird. Bowie was already planning fresh career moves. 
In 1973, he stunned his audience by announcing the retirement of Ziggy. I've had a really incredibly loyal audience for so many years now, virtually since when I started. You know, they, they, they sort of... It doesn't really matter what I do. They, they seem to follow my, my turns and all the strange, distracted things I do but quite loyally, you know? which is, I know, I'll always thank them for that. By the mid-1970s, David Bowie had metamorphosed again and was still breaking new musical ground. Station to Station provided a dose of synthetic funk and introduced Bowie's most toxic alter ego, the Thin White Duke. Do you have any idea at this stage, apart from just getting out on the stage, how you shall astound is? Or does it actually come to you in the middle of the night before? I shall probably be a lot fatter than I've been. That'll be my... No, I haven't any thoughts about that at all. The, imp the, the impact of the show has to be the astounding thing, not, not the dressing of it, you know? Yeah. Dressing of a show is just a dressing. It's uh, a sort of a perfunctory kind of thing. But the, the content has to astound. I mean, you can dress a show with a, a trillion dollars or trillion pounds worth of uh, goodies, but if the show is not uh, uh, substantial, there will be no impact. He was more into the craft of being an artist on stage than any rock star I've ever worked with. David did all the lighting on stage as the show rolled. Lights from the right, lights from the left and, and with a fill in from the bottom. This uh, pose is, is essentially a cue to his lighting director that when the hand went up, the lights went down. I didn't really embrace him fully until Station to Station, which, you know, I loved. And then Low really knocked me out. So I, I used to, it was great working with him after that because I could ask him loads of questions. I mean, he was a superstar, then went kind of more left. And when he went to Berlin, you know, things like Low, were, people saw it as really experimental. They were pop songs, but they were presented in a kind of left field way. And that album wasn't really accepted, but it was probably my favorite. For someone who claims not to be all that good a musician, why are you coming back to, to perform on stage? Or have you, are you a better musician, in fact, than you admit? I can't link those two parts. If I'm not that good a musician, why am I coming back? Yes. Yes. Well, coming back has got nothing to do with being a musician. But do you think you're a better musician after two years away from... I don't from play it? anything on stage. I'm, I'm, I'm a good performer and I, I'm a good singer. That has nothing to do with being a musician, does it? The cocaine fueled paranoia that seeped through station to station reflected Bowie's increasingly troubled state of mind, exacerbated by legal and financial battles with former managers. He'd been through quite a lot of managers, or damagers, we used to call them, and he always said, one day I know I'll find the right manager. The right man was Tony DeFries, who had this company called Main Man. No one managed really Bowie's career, he managed his own career. Where DeFries was smart, he would just stand in between Bowie and anybody who wanted to talk to him and say no, and, and, you know, and perpetuate the diva. Tony DeFries represented Bowie through his rise to stardom, reputedly making more money from deals than Bowie himself. He always said, right, in order to be successful, you must go to America. So he uprooted all of us to go and live in New York. They were inclined to have limousines on hand 24 hours a day. They were inclined to charge to the, you know, charge to the company various substances that you didn't make tea with. Main man was five years of total madness, glory, Fantastic times. De Vries had said, look, everyone has to have limos, 24-7 limos, a secretary. I mean, I had a secretary, it was fantastic. We all had assistants and everything. The offices were on Park Avenue. He got a grand piano shipped in, and there were many nights with sort of 
Mick, as in Jagger, who was staying in the plaza around the corner, would turn up and we'd all be hanging out till the morning. At one point, there were about 40 staff. I don't think David ever questioned where the money came from. The stage had to be whatever it was, 60 feet wide. David, uh, uh, Bowie would have it measured and say, it's three feet short, I can't go on. And Tony would say, wouldn't say them, it's stupid. Tony would say, yep, three feet short, we're not going on. And, uh, you know, that, that was how it, that's how it progressed, really. So David was just, A, having a whale of a time, which didn't just mean partying, actually, it meant working and doing what he wanted to do, which was creating music. Nobody thought about who was paying the bills. And then, of course, they fell out. At one point, he said, I can't handle the, the madness of David. And I remember he had to book a telephone call to break the whole contract up. And it was only, I think, because suddenly David was getting wise to the fact that he'd been working all these years. He'd had five number ones, and he didn't actually have any money. But the reason was, a lot of the money that was coming in was fueling the costs of running main men. At the time that they went off to America, I was in 75,000, as I recall, 75,000 pounds of my own money. So I said, I said, look, you know, for the next few years, you know, you, you give me, say, half a million pounds, you know, ha, 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 you know, half a million pounds, you know, more money than there was in the world. And um, a year or so later, they sent me the balancing check. And it was fine, you know, I, I was very happy. Musicians were just so grateful to, you know, sign here, you're going to get every musician you want, you're going to fly here and there, you're going to do gigs, and you're going on that great tour bus, and, and suddenly everything, like the house of cards, came crashing down. Here the freezer had fallen out big time, and RCA Records were not getting any product from David. And we organised a summit in Los Angeles. RCA pay for it, a huge suite at the Century Plaza Hotel. Barry had a suite with his people. DeFries had a suite, I was with RCA. And it was like Kissinger and the Vietnam Conference. I mean, it was just silly. I sort of called them in and I said, look, you're, all you ever guys did for me was earn me money. Um, and you're really being stupid because you're both intractable and if you both give a little bit, there's a chance you can resolve this, and if not, no records are going to go out. And Michael Littman came out and said to me, look, this is very embarrassing, but David would like you to sign a piece of paper to say you're not getting anything out of this. And I said, you tell David to go f*** off. I think at that point, David decided to become a businessman. In later years, when I tried to contact him, um, uh, I couldn't get him. I couldn't get him. Didn't want to know. David Bowie will be remembered for his astounding musical career, but he pushed financial as well as musical boundaries. Gosh. A lot of artists don't even want to get involved on the business side of things, but David did and, and uh, successfully. I do the art and then I try and sell it. <laughs> it's not much more complicated than that, really. But while I'm working on the art itself, I am 100% artist. And when I'm trying to sell it, believe me, I'm a 100% businessman. By doing so, reinforce the general impression of himself as being a visionary, that somehow he was able to see what was going to happen next, but before anybody else did. I wouldn't give you a comment on Napster. I think it's very hard for artists who uh, have reached a certain level of uh, economic means to be taken seriously when they start talking about uh, copyright issues on Napster. I'll give you a scenario, though. Uh, in around six months' time, record companies would have banded together as some kind of club. All the copyright difficulties with Napster would have been solved just in time for them to put in a fee so people have to pay to use the site, and then competition will spring up everywhere, and then Napster will be one of many. He was very intelligent, and he was very, very savvy. The other thing that he did that was way ahead of everybody else was the Bowie bonds. In 1997, Bowie made history by launching Bowie Bonds, which were as groundbreaking as his music. He was the 
first artist to securitize his back catalog, and these were 10-year bonds. You're saying to investors, invest in me, and over a long period of time you'll get the benefit by getting brought his back from work not written yet. That's money. Evan Davis had jokingly said after the financial collapse of 2008, well, we should blame David Bowie. But we did make a profit after 10 years on the Bowie bonds. Uh, society as a whole did not, and we had the financial collapse. I mean, I'm watching this thing, it's like, it's crazy. It's just crazy out there. Most industries are, are kind of in decline at the moment. They really are. I mean, industry is having a really bad time. But the, the main difference is with pl price slashing like this, the, the record industry is so different because they're the only industry where their product is actually also available for free <laughs> as competition to the price slashing. So it's a really peculiar situation. Throughout his career, Bowie remained creatively restless and constantly innovative. So, I only get five words. That was five. Four more there. That's three. During the mid-70s, he transformed again. In another unexpected career swerve, he released Young Americans. He released 15 albums in the 1970s. So, uh, blink and you missed it. The one that made Bowie a mainstream figure in the United States was Fame, which was an accident. He's in New York doing Madison Square Garden, or you know, called John Lennon up, said, what's happening, John? I'm down in the studio, why don't you come in? John popped down to see him. The guitarist and three of them were jamming on this riff that built, and suddenly you've got a song called Fame, uh, which catapulted David to the top of the American charts. <laughs> While others would have been happy to stick to the soul template that broke the US, Bowie would again change tack and release some of the most uncompromising music of his career. Endlessly manipulating his public identity, the weird aura around him was boosted in 1976 when he was cast as a stranded alien. Now, you've just finished making the film called The Man Who Came to Earth. Fell to Earth. Fell to Earth, I beg your pardon. Uh, one of the th it's, a, it's not an easy film to explain to people who haven't seen it, and, and it's not yet no. finished, is it? Um, it's finished in, uh, in visual, it's not finished in sound. I've got to uh, record um, the sound. We've written a lot of it. It's, I tell you, all I can tell you is it's uh, a love story more than uh, anything else. It's very, very sad, very romantic. It brought a lump to my throat watching it. Um, and it's been um, uh, a gas working on it. The leading criteria of his professional career, I think, was first the music. David Hammond said you put everything you had into it and you were totally professional as an actor. Cool. <laughs> do you think that's a compliment? Yes, it is. Very much so. I, I mean, do you see acting uh, taking over more and more of your time? No, directing, maybe. Let's get behind that thing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Bowie continued to progress as an actor, receiving strong reviews for the 1980 stage role as John Merrick in the Broadway production of The Elephant Man. Theatre is something I enjoy very much, and I, I don't think I could just generalise and say theatre is dishonest. <laughs> I think theatre tells a lot of truths. Uh, it's just a different way of doing things. I still like the idea of doing a theatrical thing, and uh, it doesn't uh, preclude me maybe doing one in the future, but right now I'm very happy just being uh, a singer. For the remainder of his career, Bowie confined himself to occasional supporting roles and cameos. We were asked to produce the music for Absolute Beginners, and this is a bloke who 
I thought was the best producer in the world. And I'm asked to produce him, you know. It was um, a strange, a scary experience to begin with. We were supposed to meet him at the St James's Club and Al and myself were quite scared because we weren't used to meeting sort of rock royalty like that. It was all kind of quite surreal. Then he played us the, the demo, which was amazing, of uh, Absolute Beginners. I mean, he could have put that out. So I kind of was concerned, and I think David was concerned, was like, how are we going to be better the demo? But he had his own sense of criticism. He was fun to work with, or, well, you had so much respect, so um, you, you worked hard, you know, you concentrated all the time, and things got done pretty quickly. So he was a very nice guy. I mean, it was, you know, I had one of those relationships which is very music busy. You know, I, you felt like you were friends, but I think it was only a few people who really knew what he was completely like. And he could converse about anything and it's a very attractive person, you know, and powerful, but without showing off his power, you know. I've got the cheek of the devil, then. <laughs> By the end of 1976, Bowie had taken up residence in Berlin, accompanied by sometime collaborator Iggy Pop. He called me up uh, in New York in like November and said, hey, come, why don't you come over? I've got these demos I'll play. And I said, great, I'll bring my demos. And we were, we were playing demos. And he sort of listened and went, oh, I like that. And I uh, said, you know, we could, you know, we could do this. I could come in on it, write some stuff. We didn't use anybody to kind of drive us around. None of that. That was all right out. You know? David Bowie was a roadie as well. The, the wasn't both it? of us, yeah, yeah. The, the both of us. <laughs> also, it helped having uh, having producers who uh, who were both experienced at getting things on the radio. And yes, yes, I want my stuff on the radio. Yes, I deserve it, and I want it, and I'm going to get it. I still have very fond memories of Berlin. It was violent, isn't it, man? Yeah. Did that worry you at all? Um, I think towards the end it was something that I, I, I felt I didn't really want in, part in my life too much. It was getting more violent. What he did successfully in the 1970s was so impressive because he gave Mata Hoople all the young dudes, which he produced. He produced Lou Reed, Walk on the Wild Side, and then very impressively, Iggy Pop, The Passenger is probably the best known song from that period. During this intensely creative period, Bowie released three classic albums, Lodger, Low, and Heroes. The Heroes isn't an album about Berlin, but it reflects, there's a resonance of Berlin about um, the album Heroes, because that's where it was written, and you can kind of feel that that's the city it was written in. In between sessions, Bowie found time to feature as a keyboard player on Iggy Pop's Idiot Tour. I used to go to some of the gigs on the road, but of course David didn't like to fly. He had this fear of flying. Most people would get to a hotel after the gig and fly the next day. He would go straight to his huge limo with a big Mac driver and go for hundreds of miles across America, sitting kind of slumped in the back of the seat, and somebody would always have to go with him. I went a few times with him in the car, and he sleep wasn't really on his mind. I mean, he got so drained, so tired, that it, it was a miracle that he actually finished the show. Meanwhile, Bowie's relationship with Angie had been disintegrating, and they would divorce in 1980. It was excruciatingly public, very undignified. It's the worst I've ever felt in my life, and it's totally and utterly thanks to the great, enthusiastic behavior of Corinne Schwab and David Bowie being a total and utter coward, a skank coward, because he couldn't even talk to me. I felt like I lived in the bottom of a slave ship with the rats and the excrement. After a decade as a major cult figure, 
Bowie's stardom reached new heights in 1983 with the worldwide success of Let's Dance. This was to be the most commercially successful period of his career and introduced him to a whole new generation. It's a record on the whole, a dance record, would you think? Uh, dance is uh, so diversified now. Mm. There's so many styles of dancing. Lots of different dancing. dances to do, aren't there? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the cake yeah, yeah. yeah. All and on, yeah. If you dance slow, I get, there's a slow track on it. That's right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There have been rumours that this might be the last hit tour. Would you care to stem those? Or... Um, I doubt that. I, I, I can't see that I'd be touring next year again, but uh, um, I've really got no... Uh, real feeling about stopping to it. I mean, if this goes as happily as I want it to go, then uh, it would, I'd probably tour um, uh, a lot more frequently than I have done. Let's start propelled him into that superstardom, shopping mall sort of pop star. It was a whole different phase for him. That was the phase where American radio loved him. In retrospect, it's interesting to see David say that probably that time in the early 80s when he was having those massive hits, Let's Dance, China Girl, was probably the least fulfilling time he felt in his sort of musical career. I've had big hits with albums that I really despise, frankly. You know, albums I don't like, and they've done really, really well. Uh, and it always has to be about the material on the album and whether in hindsight, and pretty fast hindsight, hindsight within like a month or two of having made it, the album, if I can really look at it and say this was definitely the be very best kind of work I could have done at that particular time. Nineteen eighty-eight brought a new venture, and what many fans perceived as a new low, Bowie's rock band Tin Machine garnered mixed reviews. Well, I had to let him sing, you know, be the singer on the first record. So now David can play a little guitar, and I can sing. You know, <laughs> and a little saxophone. And some saxophone. About this big. You know what I mean? There were two reasons why the critics didn't like Tin Machine. <laughs> One, because the record was not very good. Second the concept of a major artist trying to be the equal of people who were not major artists. To me, the first Tim Machine album was really good. We were invited along to do the sound for them one night in Kilburn, and I thought it was really good. I didn't understand it, actually, what the, the backlash was all about, because um, amazing band, amazing rhythm section, and a couple of really good songs. With David Bowie, he had to be David Bowie. People did not want him to be part of something else. After dissolving Tin Machine, Bowie married Somalian model Iman, who he had met 18 months earlier. I'm 47 years old. My stock changes on a constant base, and no wonder I married David Bowie. <laughs> we both believe in change. <laughs> the couple settled in New York, and in August 2000, they had a daughter, Alexandria Jones. I've gotten so used to the luxury of living anonymously, and my family, and, and it is how we live in New York. Nobody, you know, ever bothers you over there. It really, it, it, I, unless you're a damn fool and want to go live in LA or something, good luck to you, you deserve it, you know. I mean, but if you want, in New York, it's not, it's not a kind of a paparazzi haven, you know. So you uh, can walk quite You can have a real life, <laughs> I'm sorry, but, you know, it's like you're not just a product of the newspapers over there. You can just get on with things. Uh, and I like that, I've gotten used to it. I, what can I say, it's a laziness, I guess, you know. If I came back to Britain, I'd probably not opt to live in London, but I love London really a lot. It would be really difficult for me to go and live in Gloucestershire or somewhere, as much as I love Gloucestershire. <laughs> uh, I like to be in a big city, it's great to come. I like to catch up with folks and you know, see what's happening, and see what my son's up to and all that. <laughs> Thank you.
The new start in Bowie's private life triggered yet another transformation. He forever ditched his otherworldly persona in favour of conventionality. Hello. I like being where I am now very much. I much prefer it. I feel a lot more free about what I can do and, dare I say, what I can get away with musically. What he was doing in the 90s uh, wasn't registering with the mainstream audience. He was experimenting with, again, new and different musical forms. And uh, they didn't quite register. The albums would always come in high the first week because the fans would buy them and then they'd go down. His main uh, achievement in the 90s was that he was a pioneer in the internet uh, with his fan service, BowieNet. This was, again, being ahead of the curve. It just wasn't musical. Not many people notice but uh, actually, I was the first artist to take computers out on the road in the early, very early 80s, in fact, in the Sirius Moonlight Tour, 1983. So I've been... And we, we, were, we were going online then, and delivering all facts and figures back to home base. Um, so my experience with computers does go back a long time. Bowie continued to tour and record until 2003, when he released Reality, his 23rd album, which many assumed to be his last. It's a big tour you're starting now, isn't it? Yeah, it's gonna go on for months and months, but uh, I think we're up for it. What do you feel right now? Pretty relaxed, you know. Uh, I enjoy the songs a lot, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have a good time. <laughs> It's a struggle to understand how I'm no longer 20. I don't know anybody else this has ever happened to. Most people, they get to 20, and then they stay 20. It didn't happen for me, though. I just went on and on and on, and suddenly I'm 56. Isn't that weird? We can't wait to bring our show to you, whatever that show is. It'll be fun, all right? See you there. When he had his first heart attack, that was the reason he didn't perform anymore. So the people who were closest to him didn't want you to keep pestering them with questions of, oh, when's he going to do another show? They just said, he's had heart problems. They're afraid the exertion might kill him. But there was more to come. After a decade without a studio album, Bowie re-emerged in 2013 with The Next Day, which propelled him back into popular consciousness. He got to number two in, in Billboard, which was his highest career peak to that point, believe it or not. And that set up Black Star. Until the last, David Bowie was capable of springing surprises. Releasing Black Star two days before his death saw him innovating until the end. He did the ultimate that every musician wants, which is you die and you've got an album out three days before your death. How cool is that? I listened to the album the days leading up to his death, so what, trying to work out what it was all about, and it was a bit down. It disturbed me. I thought there was a message in it, but I didn't know what it was. Never imagined that it was a, a sort of goodbye. It was gloomy, you know, initially. Then it all made sense. I felt a bit conned. He'd sort of conned everyone. But I'd say it couldn't have been done better. He orchestrated it beautifully, with taste, the way he's always been. I mean, it was brilliantly done if you want to be depressed, not one for the children. <laughs> Even in death, I think David was very aware of what his public would think about it. The timing was so extraordinary New album, new show, both about his death, and he dies. That is the ultimate performance artistry. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's so brash and bold and brave and inconceivable, but he pulled it off. Even by the standards of an age when fame and celebrity are excessively worshipped, David Bowie's demise was an event which generated worldwide wall-to-wall -wall coverage. In the wake of his death from cancer at the age of 69, the media went into meltdown. It was 
absolutely devastating. It's very hard still to talk about them in the past sense. I'm just totally dumbstruck that he's no longer here. I really am. It's really upset me to the core. I don't know if I've ever been this emotional about a celebrity, an icon dying. His music means a great deal to me. Just really heartbroken, as if, you know, I mean, when you feel as if you really knew someone and they really touched your life. To everyone, he's their David Bowie. And he was my David Bowie for that nine month period, you know, and I thought we had something going, but he had it going with millions of people. It's a sad occasion for us this morning as we uh, put this wreath uh, here on the star of David Bowie. What an iconic entertainer, rock star, songwriter, performer, actor. You could go on and on. I didn't sleep all night and I cried last night. The minute I found out, I just, it was like I lost a family member, you know? Feeling devastated is a complete wasted emotion. He wouldn't want it, so why should anyone else do it? I think he achieved everything he would have dreamt of. People feeling sorry for themselves, they should be thinking about him. And he did everything a musician wants to do. From the Archbishop of Canterbury to George Clinton, from the Vatican to the country of Germany, uh, with all of these different uh, records and styles, he just touched an incredibly large number of different populations that when you add them all together, are the majority. I was filmed just outside of Radio 2 by Reuters film crew. I said, so when is this going out? And they said, over the next God knows how long. I said, right. And they then said in China, Japan, America, Germany, France. And he looked at me, he said, David was big, massive, all over the world. He said, we've never had uh, a moment like this as far as demand is concerned. He's left so much music behind that, you know, what could he do? He couldn't go on till 200 years old. He had to go at some point. Obviously, one can feel sorry for his wife and daughter and son, but when a child is born, that's when you should cry because you know they're going to have a life of hell and pain and shit and everything. When somebody dies is when you celebrate and feel good because they've gone to somewhere better or they've gone back to be stardust. And I reckon he's stardust.